picture the scene. You've searched the boat ads, walked the marinas, chatted the brokers, found the boat of your dreams. You've done a viewing, you've put an offer in, the offer's been accepted, you've instructed your marine surveyor. But on survey day, the marine surveyor turns up and after just a few hours, his advice is to walk away and not buy the boat. It's a heartbreaking moment. And in about one in 20 of the surveys I've done since 2008, that's been my advice to the client. I came to the same conclusion recently when I surveyed a 1970s Dutch built steel motor cruiser. In this video, we'll look at what I found during the survey, the testing that I did, and then we'll head back to the office to analyze the data and explain why I came to the conclusion to walk away from this boat purchase. Today, I'm doing a pre-pre purchase survey of a 1972 steel Dutch built cruiser. Very nice boat inside, lovely straight six Mercedes engine back from the day, but the hull's been built from quite thin steel to start with. And at 53 years of age, it's uh, showing signs of needing some serious work doing just now. Follow me around as I go around. So the boat has been built almost entirely from four millimeter mild steel plate. For the top sides and the hull, that's okay. But if you look at that central keel box section, the sides of that are four mil, as is the base, which is thin steel to specify a build. Inside that gearbox box is some poured concrete ballast, never a great friend of steel hulls. And what's happened over the years is that moisture has got into the gap between the ballast and the steel and the plate has been corroded from the inside out. Let's zoom in to get a closer look at the readings. So this is at the front end of the keel box. The sides are made from 4mm steel plate, as is the shoe. Readings on sides 3.8, 3.8, then on the underneath, a pit of 1.6, which in a 4mm four four plate only leaves you with 2.4mm steel left. And as we continue on down, you can see the readings just get worse. Here we are, roughly midships, port side, looking at the keel box again. You can see here readings of 3.4, 3.5, then on the base plate, 2.7, 3.4, underneath 3.2, underneath 2.4. So all the way on the bottom, and you can see all the rust that I've already scraped, chipped, and hammered off. And it's like it's all very wet. That's always a bad sign when the paint that comes off the bottom of a steel boat at the end of some dry weather is wet. More on that in a bit. And here's a really strange thing. This hole that I've made at the aft end of the keel box is dripping out onto this rock, which is now fizzing away nicely. I wonder what's in that. It's right below the heads in the holding tank. Hmm. You can see the base plate is in pretty poor condition and it was only four mil to start with. It's resting on just two points of contact on the lumbar supports, which is quite poor as well. Here I am trying to get some ultrasonic thickness readings along the keel's centre line on the starboard side using my Cygnus Mark IV general purpose thickness meter. Ultrasonic thickness measurement works by transmitting high frequency sound waves through the paint and into the metal and timing how long it takes the return signal reflected off the metal's inner surface to get back to the probe. To work well, it needs a relatively smooth surface inside and out to get good wave transmission and reflection. If the outer surface is rough, we use some ultrasonic couplant to flatten the surface and remove any air gaps. Or in some cases, we might grind a few flat spots on the plate, which is also known as linishing, so we can get some readings. Here you can see that the outer surface is a little rough and how tricky it is to get readings with the couplant. This strongly suggests that the inner surface is also rough and corroded. What you often find when trying to get readings on corroded steel is the meter will give some odd readings. These are often higher than the original plate thickness. With experience I know these are often multiples of the true reading. So if we get readings of 4.4 or 6.6 .6 in a 4mm plate it might be that the true thickness is 2.2. It doesn't always work like that, of course, but it's a common enough pattern that I've seen many times over the years, so I always have that thought in my mind when I'm taking the readings. Down at the aft end of the keel, on the starboard side, the readings are a little easier to get, but they're all below 4mm, and some are below 3.5, which is often referred to as the minimum insurable thickness. While some insurance companies will accept a minimum thickness of 4mm below the waterline, once you reach 3.5mm or less, remedial work becomes essential. Inside, this is quite a nicely appointed boat, a proper gentleman's motor cruiser, as we would call it from the day. Looking down into the build, lovely old school straight six Mercedes diesel engine, a lovely heavy duty engine with good servicing that would last for decades. Unfortunately, I think the hull is going to die before the engine. And when we look down into the build, you can see the classic shape of poured concrete ballast, a nice mixture of murky, oily, manky water. 
If you're looking to buy a steel hulled boat, whether it's a river cruiser, motor cruiser or narrow boat, I always strongly advise having an ultrasonic thickness survey done by a professionally qualified marine surveyor. Again, it's a classic case of a boat rotting out from the inside and also, in this case, from the outside due to poor paints which have not lasted. This boat's been out of the water for five years, I'm told, and it's not really received much love and care in that time. So having seen the survey reports from 2016 and 2005, I know that the thickness loss has been recent and dramatic. Steel is a great boat building material, but it needs looking after both inside and outside. And if you can't do either of those through either cost or the inability to get to it, you know what's gonna happen in the end. So we're back in the office. The report is written and my recommendation to my client was to walk away. On average, I make this recommendation in about 5% of all pre-purchase surveys. The reasons are always varied and of course, every survey is unique. So I thought it might be useful to go through the thinking that went into this particular walk away recommendation. Let's start with the positives. This was an attractive motor vessel with the potential to be an excellent liverboard for my client who was looking to keep it in the Plymouth area. Built in Holland with good quality steel, judging by the large sections of it that were still in very good condition after five decades of use. No previous overplating or replating was noted, which suggests it was all original 1970s steel. Internally, the fit out was excellent and offered a spacious double aft cabin, well lit main saloon and galley, a guest cabin, wood burning stove, and a Mercedes straight six diesel engine with a bow thruster up front. It's easy to see why my client was keen on buying this vessel. It would have made an excellent home for him. Now let's look at the negatives. The whole hull was built from four millimeter steel, including the keel box sides and keel base plate. And that was a surprise to find a high stress and potential impact zone fabricated from what is relatively thin steel. To then find poured concrete ballast in the build, presumably from new as well, and the picture started to worsen. As the hull flexes over the years, water will always find its way into the space between the concrete and the steel plate. And with no ability to keep the inner surface of the steel clean, dry and painted, corrosion was inevitable. I think it would have been a better design decision to do away with the poured concrete and make the keel box from a much heavier 15mm steel plate. Then if ballast was essential to trim the vessel, lead ingots would have been a far better choice. These could then be removed every couple of years so you can deep clean, de-rust and repaint the build. Looking at the test results we obtained, the ultrasonic thickness survey found readings below 3mm on the keel box sides, around the keel chine and below 2mm on the base plate where we could get them. We struggled to get readings along the keel centerline which tells another part of the story regarding the state of the plate internally. Most insurance companies get twitchy once readings in general fall below 4mm and locally below 35 which many refer to as the insurable minimum. Thickness loss is usually considered either on a percentage lost basis from the original thickness or a general minimum thickness required to be considered insurable. And by either method, this hull was uninsurable in its current state. Pit depth measurements found several pits at 1.5 millimeters or deeper, which at a four mil plate leaves two and a half mil or less of thickness remaining. Now pits can be pad welded to restore thickness loss, but this only really works for isolated pits in otherwise sound steel. On this vessel, the pits were found in plate that was thin to start with and further thinned by general corrosion. Even the most competent welder would have struggled to make a meaningful impact in dealing with the pits. Percussion testing identified more thin steel and I made two holes in the keel base plate which then started to empty the rather smelly water that was trapped between the base plate and the ballast. The design of this vessel and the lack of bilge maintenance over the years meant that this boat was very happily rotting away from the inside out. Now to make this vessel insurable and safe enough to relaunch would have required extensive overplating or replating below the waterline. Either option would have required a fair amount of steel to restore strength and thickness to the hull and extensive dismantling of the vessel's interior for the welder to work and to prevent a fire starting. The cost for the steel works alone would have been in the five to 10,000 pound range once you add in paint removal and repainting with quality two-pack epoxy paints, plus the interior works, this would have quickly risen above £15,000. Had I proceeded to do the full survey as was originally planned, the list of and associated costs would have inevitably risen further. Now my client's budget included a modest improvement fund, but the likely cost just to get her back in the water was well beyond their total budget and left nothing for any upgrades further down the line. It is never the easy option to recommend that your client walks away, but the principal responsibility of the marine surveyor is to protect their client's interests and capital. 
The surveyor must always avoid wearing rose-tinted spectacles and should seek to describe the boat, warts and all. I hope you found this video and the analysis useful. If you want to learn more about boats and marine surveying, have a read of my Boat Chat newsletter. You'll find a link in the description. And if you want to know more about the tools I use as a marine surveyor, then this video here will take you on a guided tour of my toolbox. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.